Uh, I'm not going to take up nearly as much time as I did last night uh, because we want to get to uh, Dr. Beal and, and uh, instruction on uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, just one, um, one, as far as logistical matter goes, um, if, you, if you need to exit and you'd rather not uh, walk down the middle aisle and out that door or down the side, you can uh, feel free to go out the back door and around. Um, you don't have to do that, um, but it's just another way for you to get out. We, we, have, uh, we have just sort of a, a, a tight uh, bottleneck here. Uh, so that will free up some uh, uh, abilities to get around. Um, unfortunately, our book table is, we've sold everything. Uh, well, I mean, it's not unfortunate. It's good. We wanted to sell everything. But unfortunately, if you weren't able to purchase anything, we're very sorry about that. We, we bought all the books we could. <laughs> uh, when uh, uh, Joe Keller uh, recommended it next year, we double our book buying budget. But that, that would be almost our entire budget for the conference. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, at any rate, thank you, uh, and for those of you who weren't able to purchase anything, we're very sorry. As it turned, I wasn't able to purchase anything either, so I'm right there with you. Um, uh, but uh, we're thankful that we're able to, to sell out all of our uh, all of the books and get these resources into your hands. Uh, that being said, I'm going to welcome Dr. Beal back up and uh, let him uh, take us through his uh, study. Good to be with you again. Um, if you turn to the book of Revelation, in chapter 21. <clears throat> and I'm just going to read one verse. We're going to read a lot of the chapter uh, pretty soon, but just one verse to, uh, which introduces the chapter. Um, chapter 21, verse 1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. Well, let's ask God's blessing on his word. Remembering that this book, uh, it says, Blessed is the one who reads and the one's hearing the words of the prophecy of this book and keeps the things therein. That's quite a different view than the typical futurist view that says we all have all these timetables. Um, the book is about blessings and keeping the things and obeying the things written in it. That's amazing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. This is the day you've made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We pray that, again, you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear uh, what you're saying in your word and that uh, it may influence our lives. We may be increasingly conformed to the image of your Son and reflect your glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. What we're going to look at today is uh, what I believe to be the basis of the church's mission. And it's not uh, primarily... Uh, the Great Commission in Matthew 28. That certainly is a basis. Uh, but there's a basis for mission, I believe, that goes back to Genesis 1 to 3. And ironically, we're going to be directed back there by looking at chapter 21. Now, this is going to be a very hard lecture. It is a lecture that I call a buckshot lecture. And that means I have a shotgun up here, and it's going to be a lot of passages. You're not going to get it all, all. I'm just hoping I can hit 65% of the target, okay? So, um, so, so it's a lot. I acknowledge that. And actually, we could uh, title uh, this message. It's not, not only the basis for the church's mission, but the basis for your own personal evangelization, your own, the basis for your own personal witness. And, and we could title this uh, the temple and the church's mission. We could also title it Expanding Eden to the Ends of the Earth. And so um, let's start. Uh, as we look at Revelation chapter 21, we saw what verse 1 said, that um, you have a... Uh, he first sees a new heavens and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any C. And uh, verse 2 says, I saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. 
And in verse 3, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Now, uh, as we read on, and we will read a number of verses in this chapter, on into chapter 22, uh, the only time you really hear of a new creation is back there in verse 1. Uh, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. First heaven and first earth passed away. You don't hear about the new creation anymore. You don't, you don't see as the vision develops. You don't see the forests and the oceans and the tundra and the valleys uh, and, and this sort of... You don't see that. All you see is we're going to see is the picture of a city in the shape of the Holy of Holies and um, that's garden-like. It's also called the bride. But no more, no mention of the actual geography of the new heavens and the new earth. In fact, what we find is, especially prominent, is a description of this vision as it develops uh, as a temple. And uh, especially, a lot of it's drawn from Ezekiel 40 to 48. Now, Ezekiel 40 to 48 is a big vision about the future temple uh, in a city around the temple, but the focus is on the temple. Just to give you a, a few ideas of some of the references to this Ezekiel 40 to 48 temple, uh, we have, first of all, beginning in verse 3, where it says, I heard a loud voice from the throne, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He'll dwell among them. They'll be his people. God himself will be among them. Now, that is almost a quotation right here from Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 27. That really is a pointer to the Ezekiel 40 to 48 passage because of the, of the word tabernacle, which is a synonym with temple. And then as you read on, if you notice chapter 21 and verse 10, he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem. Well, the Ezekiel 40 to 48 vision about this future end time temple is introduced in chapter 40 and verse 2 with Ezekiel being taken up to a high mountain and seeing Jerusalem. So John here is kind of a latter day Ezekiel seeing this uh, a city temple that Ezekiel was shown to occur in the future. And then in um, uh, chapter uh, 11, chapter 21, verse 11, uh, it said that this uh, uh, city temple has the glory of God. And that's exactly the description of the Ezekiel temple in um, chapter uh, 43 and verse 2. It says it had the glory of God. It's, a, it's an illusion back to that. Um, and the images of the temple continue, not all from Ezekiel 40 to 48. For example, you notice in verses 18 to 21, um, we have the city made out of all these jewels, jasper, gold, glass, foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first uh, foundation stone, jasper, second sapphire, the third Chalcedony, the fourth emerald. In fact, I have to stop here while I was writing on this passage. I was in Maine and um, uh, actually filling in for someone uh, uh, for about a month at a church. I was preaching for him, and but I was also finishing uh, my commentary in chapter 21, and I was studying the precious stones, and it was actually a beach nearby called Jasper Beach. So we went and got you know some stones and um, always intended to polish them, but we never did. But nevertheless, just a little antidote there. Um, so, uh, so these uh, foundation stones uh, continue. And uh, we have sardonyx, sardius, chrysolite, beryl, topaz, uh, chrysophras, uh, jason, and amethyst. I remember... Uh, taking a class in the Greek text of the book of Revelation 
and this was a very this was very hard to translate because these stones hardly occur anywhere else uh, in the Bible, except Ezekiel 28 and and uh, Exodus uh, 28. So they're very very hard things to translate. And in fact, even once you translate them, they're really not completely sure what those stones are in some cases. But nevertheless, the the majority of these stones also go back to 1 Kings 6, 20 to 22. They're the foundation stones for Solomon's temple. And so again, these, these stones really are seen to be stones that relate to this end time temple. In fact, if you look at the phrase in uh, chapter uh, 21 and verse 16, notice the city's laid out as a square, its length is great as the width, he measured the city with the rod 1,500 miles. Now notice this phrase. Its length and width and height are equal. Now again, remember I was talking about illusions, not illusions, but illusions uh, yesterday. This is an illusion. Uh, and it comes from 1 Kings um, chapter 6 and verse 20 speaking about the dimensions of the Holy of Holies. Its length and width and height were equal. And so the city is in the shape of the Holy of Holies. It's a square city. We're really getting, I don't want to say weird, but unusual here. And um, so we have a lot here that John is seeing a temple. And then, of course, in uh, chapter uh, 22, he sees... Uh, that this uh, city is um, also a, a garden. Notice uh, 22.1, he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal coming from the throne of God and the Lamb. In the middle of its street on either side of the river was the uh, tree of life bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. So no longer be any curse there. So uh, this, this city's also a garden. And, um, and by the way, did you notice back in chapter 21 and verse 2 where he says, I saw the whole city of New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God made ready as a bride. So the city's equated with a bride. But he sees the new heavens and earth in, in verse 1. There's no description of the geography of the new heavens and earth. It's just described as a city in the shape of a temple that is garden-like and is called a bride. Now, how can we explain the apparent, I'm going to say apparent discrepancy, that John sees the new heavens and earth and the rest of chapter 21, he sees only a city in the shape of the holy of holies that's garden-like and is called a bride. Now, it's possible, of course, if we take it as literally as we could, and quite frankly, most commentators don't, even some futurist commentators admit some figurative language here, but it could be John sees the whole new heavens and earth, and within it, he sees the city Jerusalem in that new heavens, and on that new earth, and then within the city, he sees a temple, and within the temple, he sees uh, uh, a garden, and... Um, and then, then a holy of holies there, um, and there's a bride walking around somehow. Um, so, uh, what do we do with this? It's this is possible, but I don't think that's the solution. John, I think, is equating. He sees new heavens and earth, and I think he's equating new heavens and earth with a city in the shape of the holy of holies. It's garden-like, and is equated with. A bride. Now, one thing that leads me to that conclusion is back at the very beginning. If you look at verses um, uh, 1 to 3, first of all, he sees the new heavens and earth. Then, in verse 2, he sees the holy city as a bride. And then, in verse 3, he sees a tabernacle. Now, in the book of Revelation, you often have an interpretative pattern. And I think it helps, actually, to interpret the book. Often you will have a vision, 
And then you'll have a statement that will interpret the vision. Maybe an angel will say something, or Christ will say something, or God will say something, or some anonymous heavenly being will say something, and it will interpret the vision. Or you might have a statement, and a vision comes, and it interprets um, the statement. Let me give you a beautiful example of that. In um, chapter 5, John hears, he hears about the lion from the tribe of Judah who has conquered and able to open the book. And then what's the next verse say? And I saw a lamb standing as having been slain. How, how does the lion conquer? John, what he hears is interpreted by what he sees. And then you get it the other way around. A number of these uh, patterns, sometimes it's a vision, and then the statement interprets it. And here what we have is the vision. We have vision of the new heavens and earth, and then in verse 2, he sees the holy city. Um, so he sees new heavens and earth, sees holy city, two visions, and then in verse 3, he hears something. I think it's the interpretation. I heard. What does the new heavens and earth and the city mean? The tabernacle of God is among men. He'll dwell among them. I think they're all equated right here according to that interpretative pattern. Now, to further try to uh, confirm that conclusion, which is an unusual conclusion, because basically what we're saying is something like this. I don't know how familiar many of you are with Star Trek. But in Star Trek, there was the planet of the cyborgs. And that planet was a square planet. And it was all city. Um, wasn't garden. But uh, something like that is being pictured here. Though in this case, while it's figurative language, it is figuratively expressing something real in contrast to the science fiction of Star Trek. But I want you to notice something with me in chapter 21, verse 8. You've got to follow me carefully here. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable murderers and moral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And then to follow that up, at the very end of chapter 21, look at verse 27. Nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying will ever come into the city, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So remember, verse 8, uh, those who are in the lake of fire are the uh, unbelieving, abominable, the murderers, uh, immoral persons, sorcerers, and idolaters. And it's those people in verse 27, though it's abbreviated, they cannot enter into the city. Now turn to chapter 22. In chapter 22, it says, Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter, that is, enter the city, that they may enter by the gates into the city. Now, verse 15, Outside are the dogs and the sorcerers and the immoral persons and the murderers, idolaters, everyone who loves and practices lying. That's from chapter 21 and verse 8. These are the people in the lake of fire. And so some have concluded that in the new heavens and earth, it will be quite imperfect. You, you, you have uh, believers huddled into the city, and outside of it is, is the lake of fire. Um, I, I don't think that's a correct interpretation. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the unbelievers are outside the city, but I think they're outside of it because they're in another dimension of hell, of the lake of fire, and the city's equated with the whole new creation. And that's why the unbelievers are outside of it. And so um, uh, I think this further confirms here that the city, uh, it's not a place in the new heavens and earth where, you know, uh, unbelievers are surrounding it and constantly threatening those in the city. No, they're not in the new heavens and earth. They're in the lake of fire. They're in another dimension. So, yeah, they're outside the city. But since the city is equated with the new heavens and earth, they're outside the new heavens and earth, in some other dimension that John calls, in this case, the lake of fire. 
So this, uh, there's no description of the geography of, of the new creation, only a city in the shape of a temple that's garden-like and called a bride. Now, as I was studying this, uh, I was convinced that these things were equated with the new heavens and earth, but I couldn't figure out why. But there's so many illusions in here. I thought, ah, I know the key's got to be in the Old Testament somewhere. And since the garden language in chapter 22, verses 1 to 3, where we saw a garden and there'll be no more curse, that harks back to Genesis 1 to 3, I thought, I'm going to start with Genesis 1 to 3, especially when John says in chapter 21, verse 1, I saw new heavens and earth. Well, let's go back to the original heavens and earth. So I went back to Genesis 1 to 3, and I felt that the beginning solution to why the new creation was equated to the city in the shape of the Holy of Holies that's garden-like. Um, I decided that there was a good possibility the answer for that uh, was found to be found in uh, at least in the beginning way in Genesis. So that's what we're going to look at now. Uh, if you want to go on to Genesis, and uh, we're going to look at chapters 1 to 3 selectively. And what we're going to look at is, first thing I'm going to contend, which is new to some ears, but perhaps not to other ears. And that is that the Garden of Eden was the first tabernacle. It was the first sanctuary, the first temple. Now, the, many uh, don't agree with that. I have a colleague, an Old Testament colleague from Wheaton, very fine Old Testament scholar. He doesn't agree with me. And uh, he says, look, Bill, the word temple does not occur in Genesis 1 to 3. Don't you need the word temple if you're going to make such a big deal about it? And so my response to him was, well, if, as we're going to see, uh, if it smells like a temple, if it feels like a temple, if it tastes like a temple, if it actually looks like a temple, even though it's not called a temple, it is a temple. And in fact, you, we need to think about this. Um, you don't have to have the word to express the concept. You can have a concept without the word. Take sanctification, for example. Some people think, uh, there have been some scholars in the past who have thought that if you study the Greek word hagiazo and hagios, those are the words for sanctify and holy. If you study those words throughout the New Testament, you've got the full concept of sanctification. No, you have a significant piece of the concept of sanctification, but there are other words for sanctification. Cleansing, for example. And, and, and there are uh, parables uh, about it, and there are other descriptions about sanctification. And so also, that's, that's a beautiful concept. So we don't want to make, in, in biblical studies we call this, uh, you, you don't want to make the word concept mistake. Just because the word in there uh, doesn't mean the concept is not. Of course, it would be nice to have the word there. And in fact, we're going to see we actually come close to having the word. So, so the Garden of Eden is the first tabernacle. Now, if, if this is the case, everything this morning is built on this. If this is the case, then all of biblical history is influenced by it, as we're going to see. But the first thing we have to do is see why does chapters 1 to 3 taste, smell, feel, and look like a temple. So we need to look at it. So let's look at this first of all. The garden was the unique place of God's presence, right? In the beginning, uh, Moses had to go into the tabernacle where he uniquely heard the voice of God. And so also the Garden of Eden was the place where Adam and Eve uniquely heard the voice of God. Even, you remember in chapter 8, after they've sinned, it says uh, that, that God was walking back and forth in the garden. Actually, in the Hebrew, it's he's walking back and forth in the garden. And that phrase, walking back and forth, is, is, is not three or four Hebrew words. It's one Hebrew word. And uh, it is a Hebrew word often, not always, but often used of God elsewhere in the Bible, walking back and forth in 
the temple, in the tabernacle. It is what we call in Hebrew, so you may have had Hebrew, it is a hithpael, which is a reflexive. And um, so this fits, uh, uh, this, this Hebrew word may, may reflect uh, why God walks back and forth uh, in, in the tabernacle elsewhere in the Old Testament. He's doing it here. Um, now, that, that's not a tremendously decisive point there. But together with the others, they build on one another. Secondly, the garden was the place of the first priest. Well, wait a minute. The word priest isn't used. So let's be careful we're not reading into Scripture. Well, let's look at this. Genesis 2.15, you look with me. Um, it says that God placed Adam into the garden cultivate it and keep it. The two Hebrew words for cultivate and keep can easily and usually are translated elsewhere in the Old Testament as serve and guard. Interesting. So we could technically the garden and guarding it. But they, it's translated as serve and guard. When they occur together, now, ten times when they occur together, it refers to Israelites worshiping God. That is, they're serving him and keeping his word or guarding his word. Five times, this combination uniquely refers to priests serving in the temple and guarding it from unclean things. So even if the first word is to be translated cultivate, which I don't think it should be, I think it's more something like serving, but even if it were, in the ancient Near East, temples had gardens. And priests worked in those gardens, and to work in them was priestly service. So even if this is cultivating, probably uh, it's the idea that this is priestly service. And that Adam also was one who was to guard it from uh, uh, unclean things entering. As later priests were, was, were, was to guard the uh, temple from unclean things, whether unclean humans, unclean animals or unclean snakes. Um, so I think Adam was to be the first priest to serve in and guard God's temple. Now, um, in Ezekiel 28, keep your finger in Genesis, but turn with me to Ezekiel 28. Because there we find reference to the Garden of Eden. And we find reference to a figure in the Garden of Eden who has jewels on his chest. Now, some people think this is Satan, uh, some traditional evangelical perspectives. I think it's Adam, and I'm going to explain why. But notice 28.13 of Ezekiel. You were... <coughs> Well, we start at verse, uh, middle of verse 12. You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. Now, the stones he's going to mention here are an allusion back to Exodus 28, the stones on the priest's ephod, okay? And so uh, the ruby, the topaz, diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, lapis lazuli, turquoise, emerald, uh, the gold, the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you on the day you were created. Uh, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub who covers, or it can be translated as the Greek Old Testament does, you were with the anointed cherub who covers. I placed you there on the holy mountain of God. So notice verse 13, this is Eden, and it's on a mountain. That's why water flows down from it. And he goes on and says, verse 15, you were blameless in your ways uh, from the day you were created until unrighteousness was found in you. And now notice what is said in verse 18. By the multitude of your iniquities and the unrighteousness of your trade, you profaned your sanctuaries. Now, plural sanctuaries was a term for Israel's later temple because there were different holy precincts in it. The Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, even the outer court had a level of uh, holiness to it. 
And so sometimes it was just referred to as containing sanctuaries. This is talking about Eden. Containing sanctuaries. This is the most explicit place. Actually, finally, we do have the word. Eden had sanctuaries. Now, there's only one place that talks about anybody sinning in the Garden of Eden. And it's not Satan. It's Adam. So you have to surmise, well, this is talking about Satan's fall. Well, uh, okay. Uh, but, but, you know, maybe in uh, Isaiah 14 we have reference to Satan's fall. But, uh, you know, we, we don't know where that occurred. Uh, no description of it. But even, let's say this is talking about Satan and not Adam. He's still a priest walking in the garden. Eden had sanctuaries and there was a priest there. I think it was Adam. Could have been the devil. If it was the devil, he was kicked out. Adam took over. And Adam messed up. He was kicked out too. So the point here is that in fact, the garden was the place of the first priest. And I think we can say that pretty confidently in light of Ezekiel. Um, chapter 28, and furthermore, uh, we're going to see that indeed Ezekiel explicitly calls it sanctuaries. Now notice also the garden was also the place of the first guarding cherubim. Um, when Adam fails to guard the temple by sinning, he loses his priestly role. The cherubim take over the responsibility of guarding, and God stations them to guard the way to the tree of life. He stations them at the eastern entrance. And there is a sword uh, that is there that will slay anyone who tries to get in who is unclean. And probably uh, it was Adam who had that role before, and he didn't use the sword. Uh, he probably should have executed the serpent in the name of God, but he didn't when he came in. So uh, later Israel's priest were also to guard the temple that word uh, remember where we had serving and keeping or serving and guarding in Genesis 2.15 that word guard is used to priest later guarding the temple in fact it says that they were to guard the gates of the temple so that no one should enter who was unclean uh, they were literally gate guarders uh, according to Second, Second Chronicles twenty three nineteen and Nehemiah eleven nineteen, they were called wardens, or you could translate that garters. That's what a warden is: is a garter, and uh, and they were those who were to manage a sacred ward, a guarding place. Nehemiah twelve four, and the role of the cherubim may have been pictured later in uh, the Holy of Holies with the two angelic beings uh, on either end of the uh, Ark of the Covenant. Now, fourthly, the garden was the place of the first uh, lampstand, but a tree-like, an arboreal lampstand. If you remember, uh, the lampstand in the Holy of Holies looked like uh, a walnut, or I'm sorry, an almond tree, with seven protruding branches, three on each side, and then a stalk going up. And um, uh, Exodus 25, uh, uh, thir 31 to 36 describes it in that way as a tree. And this may have been reminiscent of uh, either the tree of the discerning of uh, good and evil or of the tree of life. Furthermore, the garden was the place that probably was formative for garden image imagery in Israel's later temple. It's very interesting when you read about the temple in Kings. It's got all this garden imagery. There, there, there's wood in the holy place. Uh, it's carved wood, carved uh, pomegranates and trees and palm trees, cherubim also there. And then the pillars are pomegranates and grapes. Uh, just all this garden imagery. Why would you? I mean, it's just an architectural place. Why would you insert garden imagery into it? I think it's because it was, in one way or another, to echo the, uh, the first garden, the first garden sanctuary in Eden. In fact, listen to the description in 1 Kings 6, 18 and 29 of the later temple. 
It had, there was cedar carved in the shape of gourds and flowers, 618. On the walls of the temple round about and on the wood floors of the inner sanctuary were, quote, carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. Beneath the heads of the two pillars placed at the entrance of the holy place were, par were carved pomegranates, 1 Kings 7, 18, and following. Furthermore, another point. The, the garden was the first place, and we're going to look here, it was uh, a mount, the first place where you have a mountain with water coming down from it that had an eastern entrance. What difference does that make? Well, um, Israel's later temples were on a mountain. Water flowed out from the temple, and they faced east. I think that's more than a coincidence. Um, furthermore, um, just as uh, the temple, remember the temple had three sections, the Holy of Holies, that was square, we talked about it, then the holy place where the priest would minister, and then the outer court. There were three parts. And so also, uh, the garden uh, was a tripartite sacred structure. You have the living waters, uh, which represents the presence of God. And then you have the garden around it in which uh, Adam uh, uh, ministered as a priest. And then there was a third section, the outermost uninhabitable section. So you do have three sections. I think, again, that may be more than coincidence. And again, in the light of all this, we looked at Ezekiel 28, where indeed... Eden on a mountain was said to have sanctuaries in it. And this is consistent also. This is why the earliest Jewish writings that we have, for example, there's an old Jewish writing that's not in the Bible called Jubilees. And in chapter 8, verse 19, it says this, and this, this was written in 160 B.C., that's early. It says, And Noah knew that the Garden of Eden was the Holy of Holies and the dwelling of of the Lord. So, um, so we have a lot of reasons here to uh, uh, think that, in fact, uh, the Garden of Eden was a sanctuary. It was uh, the unique place of God's presence, place of the first priests, first guarding cherubim were there, who were memorialized later in Israel's Holy of Holies, the place of the first tree light lampstand. Uh, Israel's later temples had garden imagery, probably based on Eden. The garden was the first place where you have a mountain with water and uh, flowing down with an eastern entrance. And it was the, uh, it had a tripartite sacred structure as Israel's later temple. And Ezekiel actually calls it a temple. Now, not only was Adam to guard the sanctuary, but he was to subdue the earth, according to Genesis 1.28. See, we, 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 we got to put this in context. How does chapter 2 relate to Genesis 1.28? Now, Genesis 1.28, remember? And God blessed him and said, rule and subdue, multiply and increase and fill the earth. That's an abbreviated paraphrase of it. And... Um, he was, of course, it includes ruling over the fish of the sea, birds of the sky, etc. But how does this relate to Adam in Genesis 2? I think being a priest and carrying out the duty of a priest, including guarding the garden from unclean things like serpents, if he had victoriously ruled over the serpent, that would have been one expression, a very important one, of acting like a king, ruling and subduing in Genesis 1.28 and filling the earth. That's very important. How does filling the earth relate to this temple context of Genesis chapter 2? Now, um, we know that Adam was made in the image of God. And there, these are the aspects of the image of God based on Genesis 128. This is more of a functional description of the image, not the ontological. Ontological, I mean, it's not talking about the very being 
of us being in the image, that is, uh, having reason and a moral aspect and a spirit, I think that's part of the image of God, as uh, Ephesians will say that we were created uh, in in holiness um, and and and, and uh, uh, godliness. And Ephesians chapter four talks about uh, uh, how uh, our being is in the image of God. In fact, I'll. Uh, read that because that's that's important because I want to contrast uh, this with what I'm saying now in Ephesians chapter 4 says verse 24 put on the new man which is the new Adam which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth so that's our being this is the functional aspect of the image just as God um, uh, created in Genesis 1, Adam and Eve were to create. Just as God subdued and ruled in Genesis 1, Adam was to subdue and rule. Just as God filled the earth with his creation, Adam was to fill the earth. And just as God rested, Adam was to rest, though we never got to that part. And so um, he was to reflect God's activities in Genesis chapter 1. That's another way that chapter uh, 2 relates to um, to chapter 1, and especially how Genesis 1.28 relates to God's activities in creation. And so, uh, first of all, God blesses them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over all the earth. And notice that uh, 128 says he's in the image of God, 128 and 26. In the ancient Near East, if you had a temple, you put an image in the most sacred part. And by the way, most ancient Near Eastern temples had three parts, Holy of Holies, Holy Place, and Outer Courtyard. I think they did because they were faint, corrupt echoes of the original Garden of Eden. And Israel's temple was the true pristine, special revelatory version of And so, um, What do you do with images in the ancient Near East? You put them in the Holy of Holies, the image of the God. Well, what's Genesis 1 and 2 saying? Adam is not a dead wooden or carved image or stone image. He is the living image of God. It's the aspect that shows, hey, we really have a temple here because God now puts Adam in as an image. In fact, when it says God placed Adam into the garden, the Hebrew word is new which is rest. It's the basis for uh, Noah's name. It's rest, and it's one of the words that's used for placing parts of temple furniture into the temple. If they cause the temple furniture to rest. And that, that, that may be implied with uh, placing Adam as an image, cause the image to rest in the garden temple. And so um, uh, these are the functional ways uh, that, that Adam was to carry out his um, commission. And um, so as he was to begin to rule and subdue the earth, I think, remember that part of Genesis 128, fill the earth? As he was to rule and as a priest, and as, by the way, in light of 128 in chapter 2, he's a priest king. So as he over and subdue the earth, he was to extend the geographical boundaries of Eden until Eden extended throughout and covered the whole earth. In other words, as he creates his progeny, who are they? They're not just zombies. They're made in the image of God. That means they're going to reflect God's glory as they go out. And, at, you know, this happens to all of us. I remember I started out in a little Sears tiny two-story brick house in uh, northwestern Pennsylvania. And, uh, and, then, and then we had to uh, move to a bigger house because our family was getting bigger. And so, likewise, Adam's house, his temple was to get bigger and bigger. He, he, was, he was to extend the boundaries of Eden. Uh, and his progeny was to do so too as they reflected the glory of God and they would extend it out until... The glory of God covered the whole earth. His presence covered the earth. They were extending Eden to the ends of the earth. That's what they 
should have been doing. One Old Testament commentator puts it this way, quote, if people were going to fill the earth, according to Genesis 128, we must conclude that they were not intended to stay in the garden in a static situation. Yet moving out of the garden would appear a hardship since the land outside the garden was not as hospitable as that inside the garden. Otherwise, the garden would not be distinguishable. Perhaps then we should surmise that people were gradually supposed to extend the garden as they went out subduing and ruling. Extending the garden would extend the food supply as well as extend sacred space. Likewise, Meredith Klein, some of you may be familiar with his name, used to teach at uh, Gordon-Conwell, Westminster Seminary East and West. Um, uh, he, he would agree with the notion that uh, what this means is that Adam was to widen the boundaries of the garden in ever-increasing circles by extending the order of the garden sanctuary into the inhospitable outer spaces, which includes most of all, not just expanding geography, but expanding the presence of God, the glorious presence of God. This would occur especially by Adam's progeny, reflecting uh, God's glory being image bearers. Um, so, uh, Adam was to do this. Of course, he did not do it. He was not faithful. He was not an obedient priest. He allows in an unclean uh, being that corrupts both he and uh, Eve, his wife. So the garden temple was not extended throughout the whole earth. In fact, Adam was cast out of the garden. He did not any joy, he did not anymore enjoy God's special revelatory presence, which was the case in Eden. He lost his function as a king priest. I want to stop right there for a moment. And uh, Pastor Troutman, maybe we might stop a little early and might leave us a little more time for later. But what I want to say now is let's stop a second and let me just say so far, if it's true that um, the Garden of Eden was the first sanctuary, tabernacle, and temple, and Adam was the first priest, and he was to extend. Uh, uh, the presence of God and the boundaries of Eden to the ends of the earth, uh, I believe that answers some of our conundrums, some of the problems, uh, apparent problems in uh, Revelation 21. Why, for example, is a new heavens and earth presented in 21.1 never described geographically? Why is it only described as a city in the shape of a temple that's garden-like and is a bride? Well, I think we can begin to answer significantly why the new heavens and earth is equated with a temple and a garden. Because while Adam didn't do it, someone had to come eventually to do it. Now, as we're going to see, that's Jesus Christ. But we'll wait for that. But the intention of Genesis 1 through 2 would be that Adam's original task was to extend Eden throughout, to, throughout the earth, both God's glory and the boundaries. And so, uh, of course then, when the new creation comes, uh, the whole earth would be garden and the whole earth would be temple. If Adam had done that, then what would have happened is that God would have glorified the whole earth and that what Adam would have done would have been irreversible. At that point, consummate eschatology would have occurred. It would have been irreversible at that point. So, so this answers two, two uh, of the issues. Why can the uh, new heavens and earth be described as a temple and as a garden? Because that was the original intention all along that when history would be consummated, Adam's history, there would be the whole earth as a temple and as a garden. Why? Because he was extending Eden. He was to do that throughout the whole earth. So um, I'm going to stop right there. It's a little bit early. Uh, I don't usually stop early. But take faith.
because the next session is going to be longer. <laughs> All right? So I never waste time. But at this point, we can, if you have questions, we can ask them and then, and then take a break. And we, if we want to take now, if we want to, uh, we, we can go to um, 1035 or we can stop earlier if there aren't many questions. So, so we'll stop here. This is the end of the uh, first uh, part of our time this morning. When we come back, we're going to see why, how is this hope of extending Eden to the ends of the earth, how is that developed and played out in the Old Testament, then in the New? And how does that relate to uh, the new creation being equated with a city and also uh, a bride. Yes, sir. So in uh, 21.3, Revelation 21.3, it says that there's a city that is the No, uh, except to say, my only point in bringing that up was, that is from Ezekiel, chapter 37. I will bring it up again. Um, uh, but my only point was to say that that really introduces the temple idea that's going to be developed in chapters 40 to 48. Now, uh, some this is very important as a... Uh, a covenantal theme throughout the Old Testament and my point there would be that that covenantal theme needs to be understood through the concept of temple and why? because it's in the temple where we have this intimate priestly uh, relationship with God so I think at this point that's all I would want to say what would you want to say? (laughs) but I mean I thought maybe you had I'm not trying to be cute I thought you might have uh, uh, some ideas that you might want to share with us. I'm happy to hear it. My hobby horse is just because I had a pastor at that Jerusalem. And every time he had an opportunity, he would show us these statements in the scripture. And it was just one of the things he loved. Yeah. Because it is such a beautiful picture of the church. Yeah. And we're going to see more of it. But in this case... Really, it's the church being presented as a temple. And that's, that's, that's the idea. And I think, and, and the reason is, it's going all the way back. Let's, let's further relate it to covenant now. It's going all the way back to Genesis 1 to 3. Now, I believe that Adam, and this is nothing new to some of you, I believe that God made with Adam a covenant of works. You do this, and I will reward you. Now, uh, The covenant is not just what God told him in Genesis 2, um, 16 to 17, you know, of any tree of the garden, et cetera, you may eat. And so Adam did violate that. He broke that part of the covenant. But what many people, and I, I don't hear theologians talking about this that much, part of the covenant is not just chapter 2, 16 to 17. It's Genesis 1, 26 and 28. Rule and subdue and multiply and increase and fill the earth Adam, Adam also failed in his kingly function as well and, um, and we can talk about when that began I don't think it was just when they took of the fruit I think they began to fail earlier as we'll see a little later I think that um, Eve misquotes the word of God There's a, some think she didn't I, I, I think there's good reason to think she did once the word of God goes down, sin comes in. Yes? You put the, the Eastern in your words, and I, I know you talk much about it, but it, it's mentioned a lot. But the East seemed to be important to God, and there are brief explanations for that. Um, well, you know, in, 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 in chapter um, 7 of the book of Revelation, we do have a reference to, uh, to the East. And um, there it says um, in chapter 7 and verse 2 
I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun. Having the seal of the living God, he cries out and begins to uh, uh, talk about what's going to happen, uh, judgments on the earth. So you, you do have the angel coming from uh, the rising of the sea. You do have uh, Jesus also uh, in Second Peter and in uh, Revelation chapter 22. Uh, he's called the morning star. For example, uh, chapter 22 and verse 16 um, we're also in um, uh, chapter uh, 1, um, sorry, chapter 228. He's also called the morning star, which is related to the east. Now, why is that? Uh, if I had a student here, I'd say, hey, I'm not sure. Can you do a thesis on that? So I get my doctoral students and my MA students when, you know, I really like to research something and I don't have time, then they write dissertations on it and MA theses. So my answer is, you interested in being a student? <laughs> so I, I, there, I believe there's a, there's a biblical theology there and maybe it's related right here. Maybe it arises right out of this uh, Eastern Gate thing. Uh, in Genesis, because that's the first mention of it. So, yeah, thanks for stimulating me there. <laughs> Anybody else have an idea? Let us know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes? Um, in Revelation 21, verse 27, it says, that the 21 what? 21, verse 27. 27, yes. Yes, it says, nothing defiled. Yes. Correct. Yes, well, uh, this is why some, and we, we, we're going to talk about this, we're going to address this in the second part, uh, maybe not to your satisfaction on that issue, but one reason that futurists who believe that the book of Revelation is all about the future, uh, and they think chapter 40 to 48 is about a millennial temple, okay, a temple built in the millennium after the church age, after the tribulation, after the final coming of Christ, uh, and there'll be uh, sacrifices reinstituted. So I have a chapter in my book, uh, The Temple and the Church's Mission. And it's a chapter only on chapters 40 to 48, addressing some of the difficulties of it. And that's one of them. Uh, now, it's difficult for me, but it's also difficult for the futurist who believes they're going to be sacrifices again. Anybody want to say why that's a difficulty? For the person that thinks they're going to be a, a temple with sacrifices? How about the book of Hebrews? Uh, you know, Christ died once for all, no more sacrifices. Uh, so that's a problem for both positions. Okay. Now, I'll tell you my approach uh, in that chapter. The approach is the description of this temple in Ezekiel is lacking a lot of significant furniture. First of all, there's no holy of holies. It's just this big space inside. And there's no altar. There is uh, no uh, uh, lampstand. Uh, there's some other significant features that are missing. So now, why are they missing? I think, um, I think it's because uh, he's looking at this temple figuratively, myself. Um, but... So, so I, I think this is a figurative view of the future temple, and, um, and, and I'll, I'll talk more about why I think that. But if you want to find out more in detail, you, you could go to that chapter in my book, The Temple and the Church's Mission. But the specific issue on sacrifices, both positions have a problem with that one. Um, so, yes? Whether this is 
physical, literal, or both, and how we discern you know, as we read these texts. Yeah. Uh, very, very, very good question. Uh, I think that uh, once, if I'm correct, that the city and the temple and the garden and the bride are equal with the new creation, that's figurative right there. If I'm correct, okay? So if I'm correct on that, if John's really equating them, then, in other words, he's not explaining, you know, oh, I saw new heavens and earth. Oh, there's the forests, the rolling valleys, the tundra, the, the lakes and the oceans. No, we don't see any of that. We just see a city in the shape of a temple that's garden-like called the bride. If that's the case, if I'm correct on that, that's figurative. That's, uh, it's weird at first glance, but then it makes sense. This is no denial that uh, there's going to be a new creation. Uh, and John is not saying that the new creation is, uh, the new heavens and earth is actually going to be literally square, right? right. Um, and he's, he, he's, he's not saying it's all going to be literally a city. These, these are all things that come from the Old Testament. That, uh, both, as we're going to see, both city, garden, um, temple have to do with an intimate relationship with God, as bride obviously does as well. So, uh, but it doesn't deny that there's going to be an actual uh, new heavens and earth at all. It's in this passage, I think this is the point of it. But when Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17 says, And I saw a new heavens and a new earth, I, I, I think we ought to take him at his word. Chapter 66, 22 virtually repeats it. Uh, and, I, uh, and I will create a new heavens and a new earth. Uh, chapter 43, 18 to 19 talks about God creating new things. And so, uh, and, and then we have references throughout the Old Testament to the resurrection. Uh, and resurrection is actually how you and I will participate in the new creation. That's why in uh, uh, chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, where uh, the text says uh, Christ has died, we have died, he's been raised, and so we are living resurrection life for him. And then it concludes, one of the conclusions is, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, a new creation. And there, it, he's emphasizing regeneration, but that's consummated with physical resurrection. So, so yes, I mean, I very much believe in a literal resurrection body. I believe in a uh, you know, uh, a physical uh, new heavens and earth. Just what is chapter uh, 21 trying to emphasize? Okay. I can't believe you have questions about the book of Revelation. It's, just, <laughs> it's very shocking to me. Just very surprised. <laughs> 